So I think this bit's filmed, so I won't uh, talk about water scarcity just yet. I think I'll save that for the questionnaire at the end, which isn't filmed, to give you a bit of an inside view of what happened and that, how we felt it went. So I'm Nathan, I'm the Interim Head of Water and Planning for SEPA. As Alan said, I'm going to talk a bit about the River Basin Management Plan. So the River Basin Management Plan was to set out the process. As you know, probably it started in 2003 and the first plan was published in 2007. And essentially it runs on six year cycles. So we're in the 2027, the third cycle. And the plan was published in December 2023, a fact for which we were very grateful because on January 2023, 2021, sorry, we lost access to all of our data and information for a substantial period of time. So it avoided an awful lot of weeping by the fact that we'd actually published a damn thing three days before the cyber attack happened. So that came out in December. We're now on March. The next big step is in 2025. There's a significant water management issues consultation. So each cycle we say, these are what we think are the biggest problems facing Scotland. This is the evidence for that. This is what we think needs to happen. And then we put that out for anyone to comment on and consult on. And then that's taken account of in the draft plan. The draft plan again is consulted on and that goes out to um, the final plan, oops, which is published the next one in 2027, which will say, this is what we said we were going to do and this is what we have done. The other thing is that although the objectives are all set for 2027, River Basin Management Planning doesn't finish, it just carries on. So each cycle, every six years, there is another review of what have we done, what are the problems facing us, and those are going to change, as we've already seen, much faster, I think, than any of us anticipated. That will change as we go along. I think the main thing really to take from this, so for each water body, so Scotland has in WFD terms, I think 25,000 kilometres of river, which are broken down into units called water bodies. So that's, I think, it's basically everything you can see on a 1 to 50,000 scale map, roughly. Um, that means that we protect all the water bodies, but those are the ones where we have improvement targets for. So every single one of those water bodies has been assessed, and for every single water body we say, this is what the problems are if there are problems, this is what we think it needs to get to by, and then 2021, 2027, the different target dates. So every one of these has evidence behind it that says, this is a problem, this is what needs to be done to get to resolve the problem, and this is where it's going to end up when we've done that. So there's a very clear and solid evidence base behind every step of this, which is quite important. And the other thing that maybe this slide covers a bit, so these are the targets that we're working towards. So the green is saying where we were in 2020, the light blue is what's needed to be done by 2027, and the dark blue is beyond that. So essentially for water quality, that's things like if you can turn off, you can turn off all the sewage works tomorrow, but the impact doesn't cease immediately, there's a lag time on it. So most of the water quality is around that lag. So that's the dark blue bit of it. And then the light blue is where we're saying it's not going to achieve the objective, so it won't achieve good status. And that's because in a handful of cases, it's about saying there's an overriding financial imperative, basically there's a very important Scotland economic benefit from allowing that amount of degradation. So you can see across, or certainly obviously across the UK, the level of ambition is massively higher than any other sector of the UK. Across Europe, this is significantly higher, I think, than most other member states. So you're looking for water quality, they're all different. Underneath all these are all sorts of metrics and assessments. You can crudely lump them together like this. So we're saying 87% of our water quality uh, at the moment with 5% to be done by 2027 and a residual 6% will take a bit longer to actually come through for the benefits to be realized. You combine all of those to give overall status and what that does, it takes the worst one of every one of those parameters. So on every river, we say, what's the worst thing? That's what drives the overall condition, which is why when you add them up, it becomes less than the sum of its parts. What this doesn't capture is something Alan mentioned. So this is about improvements and target for improvement. The main thing, or a massive amount of effort, goes towards no deterioration. So every time someone says they want to carry out an activity in the water environment that may impact it, we authorise it or we set regulations around it. So a huge amount of our staff's time is spent. Again, the world doesn't stand still. There's a massive amount of pressure from development, from land use change, from climate change. A lot of our work is about preventing that having an impact on the rivers and on estuaries and on the sea and all the rest of it. So this is about the improvement target. So it's a fairly significant block of work for a large number of people. In terms of what's left to do, so I was talking a minute ago about water bodies. Here we're going to change a bit to talk about what the kinds of actions are. So there are 50, 40, sorry, wastewater treatment works, sewage works, for some reason they call them a slightly cuddlier name and CSOs, which are combined sewer outfalls. So these are combined sewer outfalls where there is an evidence and measurable impact on the environment. Those need to be resolved by 2027. There are 40 sewage works that are having a measurable impact on the environment. Those have to be resolved by 2027. 
244 barriers to fish, that's split between regulatory barriers, so essentially someone where an individual is getting economic advantage from running that fish barrier, so a hydro scheme, whatever it is. And a number of them are historic, where potentially somebody's bought a house that has a mill, and the mill, historic 17th century mill, may have a weir on it as well. So that's 200, and there's some like that, actually, which are neither. They're a, an asset, it's called, it's where it's a bridge yeah. apron or something along those lines. So 244 of those, there are 34 hydro schemes which need work to improve them for um, all sorts of reasons, but for the environment primarily. There are up to 51 urban river restorations. So these are sections of rivers which are physically altered, so the habitat is downgraded. And they're also in areas where a lot of people work or live or would benefit basically their well-being as well as the environment from that area being improved. Uh, there's irrigation and drought management we touched on that we'll talk more about in the Q&A. And then there are 141 water bodies where we think with minimal intervention, there could be significant improvements in, again, the habitat, which obviously has water quality impacts as well. And then the final bit I missed over at the beginning was 57 priority catchments. So this is where we're going in and working with farmers to get them to compliance to say, these are the rules which you need to follow. And then having, um, in the past, perhaps iterative discussions around the action they need to take in order to fulfill their part of the regulations and ensure that the impact on water quality is minimized. So removing barriers to fish migration, as you all know, there's a variety of, well, a variety of different fish on there, but a variety of different sorts of barriers and at very different scales. Some of these are relatively, I wouldn't say trivial, but relatively straightforward to sort. Others are exceptionally complicated, and that's where there's three people in the audience have been very involved with these. And I think the minister touched on the Garrel. This was a WEF project funded by WEF to remove barriers to fish migration, working very closely with the Clyde. There was about, I think, nearly a kilometre of the burn was restored into meandering. Uh, so we've got much more. There's a very good drone footage somewhere on our website, which gives a sense of the scale. That picture perhaps doesn't. But there's well, 600 metres, they could burn. Um, two fish passes, which then open up about two kilometres of um, urban habitat. And into that, we saw fish within months, I think, or weeks of the berm being opened up again. Uh, and also, it provided there's a lot of ancillary benefits to the community. It's a deprived area. There are walkways that the minister walked around with us and spent a lot of time looking at, and a massive change in the number of people using what had been a rather unloved bit of the area. So again, I think there's this theme this morning about restoring people's connection with nature. This is really important work. So that was the Garrel, and the Clyde were very involved with the project advice, fish rescues, all the rest of it. Another example is a creamery, uh, creamery weir, which was opening about 10 kilometres upstream habitat. Again, a much more substantial weir. The presumption is always to remove them wherever we can, but that isn't always um, possible. And that was working with the Galloway Fishers Trust to again provide a lot of support throughout the project. Uh, quite a significant, significant bit of engineering with that one. And then the Amund, which has, I think, seven local authority redundant weirs, which were identified as barriers to fish passage. Six of those are done. There's one more to go. I think, I can't remember off the top of my head, I think it's in the region of eight million pounds worth of spend on these projects. At one time, that was the biggest rock rank in Europe. Rock, I can't even say that, that word, rock ramp in Europe. I think it's been superseded since then. But these are quite significant bits of work and the Fourth Rivers Trust were very involved in all that as well. And then finally, this one, the River D, which was a reservoir which leads to all manner of lovely additional complexities to do with engineering, reservoirs, regulations, appointing supervising engineers, all sorts of very complicated work, which involved, again, a wide range of stakeholders and the River D group. And finally, I think for these, we've got a lot of examples of these we could talk about, but again, this one's from the Clyde, and that's 11. And again, there's a huge benefit you can see there from what had been a right angle burn, going around the corner, following a path to actually a much more naturalized river with much more habitat and uh, fish access being released as part of that as well. But, we are in a different world. Things are getting tighter, money is getting tighter, and is only going to get tighter. And we've got a lot to deliver by 2027. Um, the one thing I didn't cover before, actually, so RVP is, I think, fairly unique in terms of regulation. There are an awful lot of regulations in government, and they all set very lofty aspirations, and they all have a range of potentially duties or powers that you may choose to apply. I think RVP is unique in that every single water body has an endpoint that has to be reached by 2027, <coughs> and those have a legal standing. So you can talk as much as you want about other bits of legislation and land use and all the rest of it. This has a very discernible, final, legally enforceable endpoint, which will focus the minds of a lot of people, not least ministers who obviously are not wildly keen on breaking the law when they can avoid it. Although actually given the current crop, anyway. So uh, there is a real driver to deliver this. It's, it is a quite a unique piece of legislation. I think we probably don't appreciate those working in it, just how unique it is. 
um, for that, that really hard stop at the end of it. There is a real genuine consequence if these objectives aren't met. But that's going to be challenging. We need to think of new ways to do that. How do we do it within budget constraints? I think there's a discussion to be had about the Wild Salmon Strategy Board and what role they play in prioritisation or thinking about these barriers and helping to identify which ones are done when. So again, 2027 is the end point, but there's, every year you have to decide which project needs to move forward. There are all sorts of incredibly unusual constraints you come across. 1864 legislation was one I had to spend quite a while getting to terms with. Access where the person who doesn't own the weir doesn't want you to go across your land and there's no other access point to that burn, not even as Rob looked into, driving five kilometres up the bed of the river in the right part of the season. There is no way to access that even with a helicopter. So that poses all sorts of interesting discussions that we need to have and none of those are resolvable with regulation. There is no easy bit you can go and force someone to say, allow me to access your land to do something you maybe don't want that benefits your neighbour is not necessarily the easiest like, regulatory point to get to. So it's difficult. We need to think about how we approach some of these within catchments and how we tick them off in that way. I think there are different ways of working and I think we can restart some of the discussions around the roles of trusts and boards and that as well. Some of these essentially, well, we're a public body. We have to minimise risk and make sure we do so very carefully. That means things become quite complicated quite often. I think others have different risk thresholds and if you're not a public body, you're frankly at far less risk of being sued. So there's more capacity to do things in a slightly uh, speedier fashion that might involve cutting corners. And I think there's a discussion to be had about how those two different drivers fit in and what that means for a package of work. And obviously all this needs to be done in the context of climate and biodiversity crises. So finally, uh, I think there's a rural environment. So we've got the diffuse pollution approach, which is looking at achieving compliance with regulations. That's only going to get us so far. That was always known it would only going to get us so far. I think what we need here is pretty systemic change. And there are multiple benefits for climate change and forestry targets. I think you spoke about this this morning in terms of riparian growth, wild salmon strategy, biodiversity, national park corridors. And for me, I think the, the drive for a lot of this is the agricultural funding and how can we influence that to make sure it comes together and delivers significant multiple benefits. These problems, a lot of these problems now, the ones that are left, the reason they're left till the end, not all, but a lot of them, is because they're systemic. They're not resolved by hitting someone with a big stick. Diffuse pollution, you can't actually fix all of it. You can fix some of it by hitting people with a stick, not all of it. And these last problems are the really difficult ones, and it's only by actual genuine cooperation and collaboration across a whole range of different policy drivers that we're going to have any hope of succeeding. That's it, I think. Thank you.